All right, we're about to embark on our second panel of the summit. Um, and this, uh, this second panel is on a topic that for those of you that know me and know my work over the last 25 years in the election space is uh, near and dear to my heart. It's probably the most important thing if we're talking about the nuts and bolts of elections um, for running smooth elections in the United States and something where we've made vast strides in the last couple of decades, and that is maintaining accurate and complete voter lists. And those two aspects are really important. Um, whereas when we talk about voter registration, so much of the time the um, oxygen is taken up by those who would seek to make it a choice between affording the franchise to all eligible voters and keeping clean lists and keeping those who are ineligible maybe because they've moved or died off of the list. And what we know is that that's a false choice that you can do both, and that both are necessary to fully enfranchise voters. So I've, we've put together a great panel for this conversation. Uh, I'm really pleased to have everyone here. First, um, it's gonna be moderated by Pam Fessler, formerly of NPR, who many of you know. There's so many reporters now who cover election and election administration issues and are really doing a great job of understanding how the challenges there. Um, just for mo most of us in the room, Pam was at the forefront of that. I mean, she's someone I've been working with and talking with for um, more years than I will say for her benefit and mine. Um, uh, next to her is Secretary Maggie Toulouse Oliver of New Mexico, who is also a former county election official in Bernalillo County, New Mexico, um, who I've also known for longer than I will say. Um, next to Maggie is Secretary Greg Amore from Rhode Island, uh, just elected in 2022. Next to Greg is Secretary Steve Simon of Minnesota, who, um, what term are you on now? You, this is your term, this is your third term um, as Secretary of State of Minnesota. Next to Steve is Jeremy Gray, who's the Chief Deputy at the Los Angeles County Registrar and Recorder's Office uh, in California, an office that uh, oversees more voters than almost all of the states. Um, and, Next to Jeremy is Ryan Germany, who's the former counsel for the Georgia Secretary of State's office. So I'll leave it to you, Pam, to take it from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, David. Um, as David said earlier, um, election conferences used to be very boring. And among the most boring topics was list maintenance. Um, but that is no longer the case. So I'm very excited that we have this wonderful panel here to talk about a very, a very, very important topic. And um, it always struck me covering elections that this was an area where there generally was um, a lot of agreement between Democratic and Republican officials, election officials, the need to have clean voter rolls, uh, clean and accurate voter rolls. Um, and you put a lot of work into making that happen. That work still continues. But we also see that the, the rolls still have problems. Um, there's still inaccuracies in the rolls. And most recently, those inaccuracies are often used by groups that are trying to undermine confidence in our elections as proof that the system is filled with fraud. So I wanted to talk with each of you, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll start with uh, Secretary Toulouse Oliver and, and go down. Why um, is it so important to have clean election rolls for the work that you do? And then, um, what are the biggest obstacles that you're facing right now to achieve that? Well, thanks, Pam. Thanks, all of you, for being here. I'm very happy to be with this pretty awesome panel. Um, so as David mentioned, I started my career in election administration as a county clerk, and I actually processed voter registrations myself because there are many times, as any of you who've worked in a county elections office know, where the job just has to get done, and even if it means the, the boss lady herself has to pull up her sleeves and get voter registrations processed, that's what it means. Um, Obviously, having clean voter lists is incredibly important for election integrity because everybody wants to know that eligible voters and only eligible voters are casting a ballot. And so making sure that we have clean voter lists is absolutely critical to that effort. And I remember 
when I first came into office, so I'm a Democrat, let's just get that out front, um, <laughs> be very clear about it. I remember having sort of ongoing dialogue, I don't wanna say battles, but ongoing dialogue with uh, groups from the left who were watching the, uh, you know, it's called the different, it's called different things in different places. It's, you know, pejoratively referred to as the purge, but the voter cancellation process that we all have to undertake every single state, every two years by federal law um, as to how that was being done and whether it was being done properly. Um, and, you know, I very quickly realized coming from um, sort of more of the political side of things to being an election administrator, that this was an absolutely crucial process because the more duplicates, the more errors, the more issues you have with the voter file and with registered voters, uh, the more likely you are to have problems and questions uh, about whether or not election outcomes are accurate. Over the years, over the 16 years I've been doing this work, we have gone from having very few tools in our toolkit other than just being, you know, at least I've been an election administrator since HAVA and since the requirement to have a centralized statewide voter registration database. I can't imagine what those of you who were in this world uh, had to deal with when every single election jurisdiction in your state or the, you know, across the country had their own. Um, but that's all we had. Um, and in New Mexico, I should also say I'm very blessed that we're one of the states that has been able to use social security numbers. We were grandfathered in under the Social Security Protection Act. So we've always had that tool in our toolkit in my state, which has been great. But um, with the evolution particularly of ERIC uh, and being able to not only share information with other states, but also to use the social security master death file, um, we're able, we, we follow I think now in our state the gold standard. The challenges moving forward, I'll be very brief since I've already talked quite a bit and we have plenty of panelists, um, are that I think there is an expectation that somehow voter lists should be perfect and that is just literally never going to happen. We have a transient population in this country. Voter registration is voluntary. Uh, it may be automatic in certain places, but it's still voluntary. And so we're never going to have a perfect list at any given time. And so figuring out how to not make the perfect the enemy of the good and to be able to have a high level of accuracy and confidence, that's our challenge moving forward. Uh, Secretary Amore, I, I know that you're only, you've only been in office, what, four months. Um, so how do you see the challenge of, of keeping accurate roles in Rhode Island? What are some of the things that you face? Yeah, so ju just about 15 minutes ago, I was a high school history teacher worrying about my, my list of students. Uh, that, that has <laughs> Which was like 35 students. That has expanded students, significantly. Right? <laughs> uh, but, but I would agree uh, with Maggie that you know, the, the best pushback uh, on questions surrounding voting um, is, a, is a solid voter list. Uh, and and we, we need to do everything we can to make sure that that's the case. Um, as a legislator uh, prior to my time as Secretary of State, uh, I sponsored what is known as the Let Rhode Island Vote Act. And the Let Rhode Island Vote Act basically expanded voter access in, in many ways. Uh, drop boxes uh, in every community, at least one drop box in every community, uh, no excuse mail voting, um, uh, the opportunity to not have a, a witness or a notary uh, on your uh, mail ballot application. So expanding access. But a, a key element of that bill uh, was the requirement for the Department of State to uh, do voter list maintenance four times a year. Uh, prior uh, state law required two times a year. This would require four times a year. And to Maggie's point, uh, my primary opponent uh, accused me of wanting to purge the list, and I'm, I'm a relatively progressive guy, uh, and I have a record, a 10-year record in the General Assembly uh, as a relatively progressive guy, and, and there's a confusion. Um, and, and so we talk about left and right and where the denialism comes from, where the, where the pressure points come from. It comes it come from both ends of the spectrum. Um, and so, you know, we make sure that, that we explain what that means. And I think, you know, the pre prior panel uh, did a good job of talking about how important it is to take the time to respectfully uh, explain the system. And, and you know, if I can s speak to a small group of people and there's a ripple effect uh, based on that conversation where we talk about the fact that we're receiving information from our Department of Corrections uh, twice, twice a month where they're, they're indicating who is incarcerated, who is 
been released, that we're receiving information uh, um, every other week from the Department of Health, that we're, we're receiving our ERIC reports. You know, that calms people uh, and, and makes them feel better about the process. But I think it's, it's a process. This is not a soundbite uh, situation. You really have to make your case in small groups and in large groups when you can and explain the system. And when you do that, uh, people gain confidence. Um, Secretary Simon, um, <clears throat> you know, why, why is it so hard to have clean voter rolls? I mean, why, what, what are some of the challenges that you face? Well, I would say this. I agree with everything that's been said by my uh, Secretary of State colleagues. I, I, it's obviously foundational to have clean voter rolls. Um, the coin of the realm, though, is data, is information. It's only going to be as good as the, your information. As others have said, we screen and filter using multiple databases, some federal, from sta some state, the very glamorous Social Security death index, <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of morbid, but it's really important to know who's on the voting rolls um, and that only the people who should be are. I agree with Secretary Amore that list maintenance is not the same as purging. It just isn't. You want clean voter rolls. You want people who have moved. You want people who are deceased. You want people who otherwise are, do not belong on those uh, voter rolls to be off those voter rolls. I think Eric, uh, a talk, topic I hope we'll come to, has been extraordinarily helpful we to us We definitely will come to that topic. Right. <laughs> right. Well, it, because We're it's all about data. That. No, it's all about data. And where are you going to get data? Uh, and Eric has been very helpful. Let me just raise one particular challenge that I know others face. We are a same day or election day voter registration state. It's, it's, it's welcome. Almost 50. Uh, years ago from this date, 1973, Minnesota was one of the first uh, early adopters of same-day voter registration. And in the previous panel, um, there was a discussion about election disinformation and misinformation. And as, so, uh, as is so often the case in that realm, there's a kernel of truth that grows into something far uglier and, and more toxic. And in same-day voter registration states, naturally, people register on the same day which gives rise to all sorts of conspiracy theories about 104% voter turnout or 109% voter turnout. And very often, the spike in turnout uh, or registration is due to same-day voter registration. Uh, it's nothing nefarious. It's not a conspiracy. It's not fraud. It's a function of the laws that we have. Uh, and so that's a challenge in this era of disinformation is explaining that particular feature of our system. Um, Jeremy, I know that you, um, you you have a different perspective because you're a, run a or deputy at a county yes. election office, um, so you're much more on the front lines. Do you see? I mean, are, do you get a lot of um, pushback um, in the county from people who say, "Hey, these voter rolls are a mess," and then how do you respond to that? Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, n number one, you know, LA County is. Uh, larger than 40 of the 50 states in, in the country. <laughs> right. So we have a unique perspective in that, um, you know, we manage at the grassroots, but our size, scale, and complexity, it gives us a bird's eye view of some of the national challenges and issues that we deal through, with throughout the country. Um, I, I think it's very important um, in this subject not to delineate uh, our voter rolls from any other identity-based process that we have in any other sector. So my background is, is um, primarily in information technology. For the last 10 years, I've been in and out uh, of, of elections, but ultimately it's very, very important to understand that our financial institutions, our healthcare institutions, and our public safety institutions are dealing with the same challenges as it relates to managing accurate data uh, related to our constituency. Most individuals also don't associate the challenges that we're having, not, not just in California and LA County, but throughout the nation um, in housing. Uh, 30 years ago, um, you moved into a home, you stayed there for 30 or 40 years, you may hand that property down to uh, your family and that stays in the family for 50, 60, maybe even 100 years. Um, that was tremendously easy to track at our various registrar's office and our assessors and our property tax um, organizations, uh, et cetera. And it's no longer like that, I think. Uh, one of the 
earlier panelists stated that um, we, we manage a very fluid uh, community now. There's a lot of movement associated with that. Um, we are a vote by mail uh, state, and, and the minute someone uh, receives a ballot uh, from the previous resident, um, though that individual may have moved out a week prior, um, you have a perception that uh, we are not uh, managing with the appropriate level of quality control. So it is a lot of complexity involved when you're managing such a large identity-based management process. Yeah, and I think, uh, so, so Brian, maybe you can answer this. Um, you know, the average American looks at these and say, well, how, you know, how, why are the roles you know, still inaccurate. They, they don't quite understand some of these delays or some of the challenges that you say you face. And they say, you know, uh, companies have tracked, are able to track down my, um, you know, uh, uh, lists of people who are customers, you know, that there are other lists in our society and our economy that are, ver that are up to date and very accurate. Um, how do you explain that, you know, in, in, say in a state like Georgia to the, to the voters? that there are all these issues? Do you, do you have an education process, or how, how do you deal with this? Yeah, thanks, Pam. Um, my name is Ryan Germany. Uh, I was general counsel at Secretary of State's office in Georgia from January 2014 until in January of this year. And I told my wife it was going to be a two to three year job, and I was there for <laughs> so I missed that one. But uh, when I came in, I had a lot of litigation experience which I think ended up serving me pretty well in the office, but I didn't know a lot about elections other than voting and turning on the TV and seeing who won. And what I learned pretty quickly is what everyone in this room knows, that running an election is a complicated logistical exercise that requires a lot of teamwork from the top down, from a state, from at the top of the county like Jeremy, all the way down to people at the polls. Um, and across a whole state, whether it's a state like Georgia or California or any of these states, it's a complicated logistical exercise. And uh, that's why list maintenance is so crucial because it's really, it's really two things. List maintenance is, one, it's a voter-centric um, thing to do because it, makes, it helps make sure that when a voter shows up to vote, everything is right. You know, you, want, you don't want them to show up at the polls and they're outdated information or, or something like that um, because then that takes longer at, for the poll, for the poll we're gonna handle. People around it see it and it just looks like mm, this thing is not really that smooth. So it's really a voter-centric exercise. And two, um, a wise man told me this and I'm stealing it from him, but list maintenance is enfranchising. Uh, because a lot of what you're doing is telling voters, hey, here's what we have, looks like it might be out of date, can you update this, and, and especially do so before you show up to vote. Um, now, that being said, some of the difficulties of list maintenance are, when I was at Secretary of State's office in Georgia, we were definitely the recipient of, of a lot of those uh, tweets with filing fees that <laughs> Professor <laughs> Levitt was talking about. And, um, particularly in the run-up to the 2018 election in, in Georgia, and even the 2016 election, we were, we were sued uh, by groups on the left who were basically calling any type of regular list maintenance that we were doing voter purges, use it or lose it. I mean, all, all kinds of very Twitter-friendly type uh, phrases. And these were old laws in, in Georgia. There was, they were not new processes or new laws. They were existing laws. They were actually passed by a Democrat General Assembly and signed by a Democrat governor. But because the, they had a narrative they wanted to forward about, you know, particularly my boss at the time was then Secretary Kemp. He was running for governor. And so these things that had been very well accepted election administration practices all of a sudden became very controversial. Um, and frankly, that wasn't really something we were prepared for at the Secretary of State's office. Um, and then, on, on the, to the other side of it, on the, on the right, following 2020 election, we, we saw all these lawsuits about 
um, from, from people uh, affiliated with uh, Trump that, oh, here's this inaccuracy and these people voted who didn't live here and, and, all, and all of this stuff. And, and it's, it's a difficult process to, um, to really run perfectly because of just data and time and giving people notice. So to answer your question, Pam, you know, one thing that we, that we do is there's a lot of notices in the law that are given to voters. And, and frankly, I would say that I think voter lists are a lot of times more accurate than some of the lists that companies have because it doesn't really matter if they send a catalog or a piece of mail to the wrong address. And we get that a lot in when kind of the political groups will send out mailings, they're sending them to the wrong person. Right, And right. it causes all sorts of, uh, you know, calls to election officials and the county level. What is this? I don't live here. You know, we've, we've had them, I think one, one group uses magazine subscriptions to send out uh, absentee ballot applications or voter registrations. And th every time they send out stuff to pets. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's just a great way to, you know, start a conspiracy theory. Uh -huh. And so, and so I, I think election officials have to be very careful, and I think they are, more so than maybe some of these other groups have to be. So I'm, I'm curious how um, much you think the problem is education, you know, educating the public. This is how the system works. This is why we are taking people off the rolls, you know, cleaning the rolls. Um, this is why there are sometimes inaccuracy in the rolls or why you might be getting email, I mean, mail from a third party group. They always, people often think it's from the election office. So how much of it is actually of your challenge is educating voters about exactly how the system works versus the logistics of having an accurate system. Who, who, Steve? Can, can I just, yeah. one subtopic that comes to mind is this, just as a matter of common sense, and I ask this a lot of folks in Minnesota, how many people do you know, regular people, not people who are attuned to these issues like the conference attendees here today, but how many regular people do you know who when they move out of a state, after all of the checklisting that they do, oh, got to change my magazine subscriptions, I got to change this, the, you know, the Christmas card list, how many people do you know who say on the way out the door, oh, I better call my local elections office and let them know I'm leaving so they can right. take me off the list. I mean, my Nobody question is, does, does anybody do that? Nobody <laughs> does that. I haven't done that. Right, right. And so, um, <laughs> in the past life, in a long time ago, long time ago, when I was a college student, for example. No, true example. I don't remember ever do doing that when I lived in another state when I went to college. Uh, most people don't do that. Right. With the reality that that means there are people who are on the voting rolls in more than one state. It's right. nothing nefarious. It's not a conspiracy theory. And, and I don't mean to make this political, but both the Trump children and the Biden children, it turns out, when people looked at records, were on lists in a couple states. It doesn't mean they were bad. It doesn't mean they were perpetrators of fraud. It doesn't mean they were up to no good. It means they were normal, rational Americans who are busy and going about their lives. That's just one example of why list maintenance matters. It's not that people are doing anything bad, it's just you gotta keep track of this stuff. And I think we'll get into later some of the tools that we can use. You have 40 million Americans yearly changing address. Right. right. So that's a significant number. And to talk to your education point, um, we, we removed uh, nearly 61,000 voters um, from our list in January. Now in a, a state like Rhode Island where we have a population of one million, that's a significant number. It was part of regular voter maintenance, but it was reflective of the 2020 election where mail ballot applications were sent to every registered voter. So the ones that were returned to us as undeliverable, those folks were made inactive. Uh, they, were, they were placed in the inactive list. Uh, two consecutive federal elections, they did not vote, and they were removed from the list. We made it a point uh, to issue a press release so that we could talk about this. We, we wanted uh, Rhode Islanders and the Rhode Island media to ask us questions about this so we could explain the process to them. Um, I, I ran into a, a Rhode Island senator on the way out of the state house one afternoon, and, and Republican senator, I, I would say a Trump voter and supporter, who said to me, hey, great job. 
you know, <laughs> she was very happy. I said, you'd be happy, unhappy to know 50,000 of them were Republicans. Uh, that's, that's a joke. That's a joke. Um, but, but, you know, we want that conversation to happen. So I think your point is, is correct. The education around this is incredibly important. Because I think one big problem I often see when I talk to people who are worried about um, these voter rolls, um, people don't understand the difference between active and inactive, all these, you know, so it comes back to this education or just trying to get the public to understand. Definitely. I, I, would, I would also add that um, using some of the earlier examples of just human behavior in general, um, how many of us receive mailings or correspondence from previous resident that maybe lived at our home uh, before us or unfortunately uh, receive um, information from someone in our own household that has since been deceased. Um, my mother passed away in 2016 and um, I don't receive um, any voting material for her but what I do receive is marketing material, um, material from her previous financial institution, um, etc. So it's, it's very important um, when we educate the public, we ask them to look through a, a broader lens than just voting. It does not absolve us of any level of responsibility to manage uh, quality voter rolls, um, but just take a step back and really look at those other variables all around us, and they'll soon see that, in fact, the voter rolls are probably one of the tighter processes in our communities today. Pam, so, one, oh, sorry, sorry two, quick, two quick points. Um, I think one thing that really helps and we've seen in Georgia <clears throat> is sometimes in the, in the media, um, especially when, it, when it's surrounding sort of the political process, a lot of the coverage can be kind of coverage of the tweets with lost tweets with filing fees. I love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's going to use yeah, that. Yeah, but that was a good one. Um, and we, one, one thing that we did in Georgia, and I can't remember if this was 2019 or 2021, but worked with the local reporter. He went out and found people who were about to be removed or, or that went to the addresses. And because the, the, a lot of the coverage was, oh, we're about to purge all these people. You know, that's the typical coverage. He went and he actually talked to, went to the address and found they're not here. This is, this is and if they are here, they didn't want to be registered to vote. And so when you actually go and do a little bit of kind of on the ground reporting, they found, okay, this is n nothing to see here. Everything's kind of checking out. Um, and then the other thing is, it's asking a lot of, a, of election officials to educate voters on why somebody who we're pretty like 99% sure has moved to a different state remains on the rolls for four years. Right. That's a process uh, that's in, um, it's in federal law, and I think one of the questioners of the last panel said, "What can the federal government do?" Um, uh -oh. As I as I say as I say this, I know it's very unlikely, but you can they could look at the laws that say, "Okay, in the '90s, maybe that made sense when things were primarily by mail and telephone and things like that." That's not the world we live in mm -hmm. anymore. So right, right. that length of that two federal election cycles is a long time once you've notified or once you've identified someone and say, hey, they're no longer in, in this state. Right, especially when you have so many people, as Secretary Morey mentioned, moving every single year. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the main tools that are out there to help you um, um, uh, maintain your voter rolls. And one of the biggest ones um, that a couple of you have referred to is ERIC, which is the electronic Registration Information Center, and this is a, for those who don't know, this is a, um, a basically a state-run or state member organization or network where states can share their voter registration information, compare their lists against each other, and also compare their list against more um, other national databases like the um, Social Security death records, the um, change of address forms, in an effort to identify anomalies, people who have died, people who have um, um, are registered in two or three places. Um, I think at the height, about 32, 33 states belong to ERIC, but over the past year we've seen um, seven states have actually just recently pulled out of ERIC. 
and it has um, been subject now to some criticism and also misinformation campaigns that it is a left-wing effort to uh, run by George, uh, not funded by George Soros, um, to to manipulate the voter rolls. So, can, if you all can sort of talk about. <clears throat> How you see Eric? You know why? Why is why are these attacks coming? Do you see, see any legitimacy on the attacks? And then just what impact that's having on your ability to um, um, improve your voter rolls and the accuracy? Well, I'll start by explaining how New Mexico came into Eric. So we were probably one of the the sort of middle set of states to come in after some of the first guinea pigs you know, started it out and tried it. And um, at the time, I was a county election official. And, you know, as the the clerk of the largest county, for me, I saw the greatest benefit in particular, um, you know, a highly transient population in my county, um, and also really wanting access to that social security master death information, because it is such the easiest you know, thing for people to fling out without any evidence, oh, there's all these dead people on the voter rolls, right? I'm like, I want that data. So at the time, um, I was working with a then Republican Secretary of State and a Republican governor in New Mexico, and we uh, convinced everybody that this was a great nonpartisan tool that we needed in my state, and it was passed and signed, and I think we even passed it when we had a Republican majority in the House of Representatives in our state, which was the one and only time in 80 years we had one, because we were able to make the case that this is good for list maintenance and data and keeping accurate voter lists, which is what everybody says we want, right? Um, and so since then, we've seen it as a really incredibly effective tool. Um, we're looking at actually ramping up, you know, there's some bare minimums for list maintenance that you have to do under your ERIC agreement. We're actually preparing to ramp up and do more of that on a more regular basis now that we have um, more tools in our toolkit. But in terms of your, your question, um, look, you know, I understand this is a highly political uh, and has become a partisan issue. Um, and I realize, like, I am not of the right party, <laughs> I guess, to, to make this argument to folks on the other side. Um, but, you know, as, as my colleague from Minnesota said, you know, data is the coin of the realm. Um, that data is absolutely critical to my state's ability to have the most accurate voter rolls possible because Eric is the one uh, source in the country that has the most interconnectivity with other states. Um, and yes, you know, I think we'll, we'll hear some arguments about, you know, potential other, you know, uh, consortiums popping up and things like that. Eric is tried and true. The security mechanisms are there. And that, for me, too, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues will talk about you know, why the, the level of security in terms of sharing data is so critical. Um, so for me, I reject, I reject the partisanship argument. I reject the fact that this was some, especially when you look at how it came to be in my state. Right. right? So. Well, actually, I'm going to go right to you, Ryan, first. <laughs> then we'll get to everybody else, just because you are the only Republican, I think, on this panel or identified as. So, so what, what about in Georgia? I mean, have you, you guys are in the Eric system. I mean, have you seen a lot of pushback from groups who say, hey, look, this is just not the most accurate or a, a most effective way to um, monitor the roles? So. I was at Secretary of State's office before we were in ERIC and since we were in ERIC. So I've uh, seen list maintenance from the state perspective on both kind of pre-ERIC and now with ERIC. Um, and I'll say that with ERIC, list maintenance is so much better um, because, yes, you get the, you get the data. Uh, but it's not just about the data, it's what do you do with the data? You've got to have clean data, you've got to have it formatted in a way that makes it usable. Um, you've, and, and it makes it usable and actionable quickly. So you've got to have, you know, Eric spends a lot of time on the front end, you know, working with formatting of data. It takes a long time, as all these people know, to, to get sign off and make sure that everything is the format, because then you can use it. Whereas you know, someone can dump a bunch of data on you that's not really usable. Um, so I mean, we, we, we have just seen that list maintenance is so much better with Eric. And yes, it's because of the cross state data, but even without it, it makes it for better in-state list maintenance. Um, 
it makes for uh, you know catch, catching um, more more dead people that we might not catch to our normal state process. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that, and then secondly, you know I, I think the. We're so used to pushback in Georgia on kind of which, whichever. <laughs> this is which, the least of your worries. Which, which, right? which, whichever thing we do, there's a lot of pushback. So that's kind of freeing in a way. Okay, well, right. what's the best way to do it? And um, I think we saw it. I think a lot of the pushback is similar to what we saw pre-2018 election, where these were existing kind of non-controversial processes right. that all of a sudden fell victim to a narrative that was being pushed by people with um, a, a reason and resources to push that narrative. And I think, unfortunately, Eric is kind of basically next in line of the narrative of the people who um, <clears throat> you know, want, to, want to push the, the voter fraud narrative. And you know, I just think if we could get out of the, uh, I'm, I'm, st I'm stealing this line too, but <laughs> someone said if, if we could get out of the voter suppression and voter fraud voting wars, then there's a lot that can be accomplished. Um, Secretary Simon, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. You know, why do you think that we're all re we're seeing this pushback against Eric? And then just in, in Minnesota, what impact is this controversy having yeah. uh, in what you do? Well, I'll start with the second question first, if you don't okay. mind. Obviously, the more states that are in Eric, the better. You want as rich and deep a data set as possible. You want states from as many uh, data from as many states as possible, and it's in every state's selfish interest to have as much data from the states that have as much uh, as possible traffic between those states. So in Minnesota, uh, the premium states for us would be our surrounding states: Wisconsin, Iowa, North Dakota, and South Dakota, uh, or Upper Midwest in general. Um, and so anytime a state leaves, it's not a good thing, although I, I do want to uh, uh, reassert con some control over the narrative. I think Eric is in, is in very good shape. Over half the state, uh, over half the people in the United States of America live in Eric states. There are more states, even with the recent departures, than there were in 2020, many more than there were in 2018 and 2016. So obviously this is a bump in the road, but this is not cause for doom and gloom. It's a setback, no question. To your point about why. Uh, to be fair, no one on this panel is in Eric skeptic, and I want to be fair about the fact that I'm, I'm not as good a spokesman for those folks as they are for themselves, but I'll do my best objectively and try to be faithful to what I understand the arguments to be. One argument has to do with uh, Soros funding, and, and, and that is nonsense, and that isn't a real mainstream argument, but I want to get it out there. That's not true. It's funded by the states. The other is this idea that um, uh, the duality of the mission of Eric, and we've only discussed right. one of the missions here, but there's another one that, in my judgment at least, is, is central to the founding of Eric. In fact, if you go to Eric's homepage right now, the first sentence of the entire homepage at the top talks about the dual mission, not one, but two, which is both voter outreach and accurate voter rolls. And there are some, I want to be faithful and fair, who object to the manner in which the uh, voter outreach component is, uh, is being run. In other words, there are certain uh, duties, responsibilities that states in Eric have to do, uh, have with respect to that. They have to do uh, a certain kind of mailing. Uh, right, to, they basically have to send right. out to, you know, Eligible identify the people, right, who right. are not they registered and say, hey, exactly. you might want to get registered. Right, and there were some uh, states that have expressed um, concerns with that requirement, that they don't like that requirement for various reasons. Maybe it's cost, maybe they see it as extraneous or not related to what they see as the, the primary mission of Eric. I disagree. I think the language of the homepage um, states pretty clearly what the grand bargain was at the founding of ERIC, which is, yes, we're going to trade this data, but we're also going to make sure, all of us who are members of ERIC, that we do these mailings to eligible but unregistered. Everyone knew when they signed on the dotted line. And it's only quite recently, really about a year ago, that a particular article appeared in a particular Wasn't ideologically even, I think it was driven like four months ago, I think. publication. Well, I'm thinking of a different one. Oh, OK. Um, that at least I date some of the heightened skepticism to that. But, but, to, but to be fair and to try to be faithful to the argument, it, it seems to be mostly centered around 
the obligation with respect to these eligible but unregistered mailings. Yeah, I think that's interesting, you know, that that, that, that was sort of a, a, a side of the controversy that I didn't anticipate, sort of this um, argument that it's not really our job to go out and register voters or to increase the voter rolls, and I say our job, meaning election officials, um, that if people don't want to be registered, you know, that's, that's their right. We shouldn't be pushing people who don't want to take this step um, themselves. Is that something that you're seeing, Secretary Moray, in uh, yeah, Rhode I mean, Island I, at all? Or? I don't think there's an objective analysis of ERIC that doesn't come to the conclusion that voter rolls are more accurate, accurate if you're involved in ERIC. So, so, I mean, that's just the foundation. But I mentioned the Let Rhode Island Vote Act uh, previously in, in my remarks. And the dual mission uh, that Secretary Simon talked about is what, what we used in going into the Let Rhode Island Vote Act. We wanted to make sure that we expanded access while at the same time made sure our voting rolls were accurate. And you know, I, I, I find it uh, interesting that this, the ERIC system, uh, when it was first rolled out in the original states, was lauded uh, by Republicans as a way to avoid fraud. Um, and I, you know, to the Soros uh, point, you know, it's interesting because we started this conversation talking about the difference between voterless maintenance and voter purge. And you know, the, some of the criticism was there may be purging here. And and I, and it's it's fascinating to me that this is it's it's a pattern of projection uh, that that continues. Um, and I I see no again no objective analysis that that doesn't come to the conclusion that being a member of ERIC uh, creates more accurate voter rolls. Well, and it's interesting, some of the, in some of the states, um, the secretaries of state, the, some of the states that have pulled out, the secretaries of state or other high, uh, high election officials were praising the system actually weeks before they pulled out, saying it was the best tool. Um, interestingly, Jeremy, I would just want to bring this, so California, we, we were, uh, Stephen was talking about uh, that the more states, the better that are in, um, in ERIC. But California, maybe you can talk about what California has not been in ERIC. De definitely. We, we are optimistic at the local level that the state of California will become uh, a member of ERIC. We, we are. Yeah. There, yeah. there uh, <laughs> is a recent Assembly Bill AB 1206 um, and the California... Uh, clerks and elections officials have taken a position of, of support. Um, I, I think first and foremost, let me say that, uh, you know, for the most part, local registrars don't have the burden of, of partisanship. So you're not going to hear me reference right or the left or any specific political party. Um, ultimately, the objective is to administer fair, transparent, accurate elections. And if you talk to a registrar within any state, I'm going to assume that they're going to state, in fact, just that. And at the end of the day, if you are managing a large data set of any kind, and that data set is insular, having no connectivity to other sources to ensure accuracy, um, I assure you that is not best practice. And for us in LA County, we see Eric as a potential vehicle to improve even further a lot of the activities that we go through rigorously um, and routinely on a normal basis to keep um, accurate uh, voter rolls. So I, I think that's, that's very important uh, to highlight. So, so why, why did it take so long for California to join? Yeah, I, I cannot speak for the Secretary of State. I understand <laughs> that, you know, because of the size and complexity, there were areas regarding uh, cost and, and other factors that they are looking at. Um, but again, we're, we're optimistic that uh, we're move it, moving in the right direction, especially, um, you know, we take a certain level of responsibility as the largest local electorate in the nation to be vocal on these matters. And we have, um, in fact, supported uh, California adopting this. Right, because uh, you mentioned costs, because states do in fact pay to be part of this network. Yes. Um, I'm just curious, uh, any of the panelists, what, what do you see happening? I mean, do you think that there's going to be a continued erosion in support for um, Eric, or will it be, um, is this just sort of a little blip and that uh, it's gonna restream? I, I, think, I think states will realize as they try to replicate Eric, that it's very difficult. In our case, 
uh, about 30% of our interstate movement is with Florida. So as Florida removed themselves from Eric, we're, we're working on uh, the Florida database and trying to line up uh, as best we can without the reporting mechanisms that Eric provided. And it's burdensome. It's burdensome. Uh, and so we're having difficulty with that. I think That's because Florida has one of the states correct, that's pulled out. Correct. And I, and I think states will realize that uh, it's difficult to replicate uh, what Eric provides. And I, I'll go with the previous panel's optimism and say that as time moves on, uh, I think states will return. I think so too, and I do think you know there are some legitimate questions that have been raised. You know, Eric is now a ten-plus year old organization. Um, I, I still personally believe strongly in the founding principles of Eric. I think those of us who are current Eric member states very much do. Um, but you know, as with anything, as time moves on, as technology moves on, as the conditions under which we are operating evolve, it is necessary to sort of look at the, at the inner workings and at the mechanics of the organization and say, hey, is there room for improvement here? And I think you know, the, the, the global political argument has ended up being sort of fought along these very you know, fractious minor detail lines within, say, the bylaws of Eric and things like that. Um, I don't necessarily think that discussion and maybe even looking at bylaw revamping and things like that are a bad thing. I think, you know, we all know, you know, over time as things change, but, but I, I do share my colleagues' optimism that we can do that in a civil way and if we can, you know, move away from sort of the global political argument and look at the mechanics of how Eric functions and what does it need best to function for the states it serves, for its member states, I think we can do that. So what kind of improvements would you like to see? Well, I mean, I think there, you know, is legitimate uh, discussion about the eligible but unregistered mailing and whether or not you know, uh, the way it's sort of uh, being mandated now is the best way to do it. And I think, you know, those of us who even strongly support, I know Steve and I have had so many side conversations about Eric in this last several months. Um, even those of us that really support that are, are open to a discussion about what that looks like moving forward. Not, not necessarily the whether or not, but the how. Right. Um, we have states that are in Eric. Mine is a brand new uh, back-end automatic voter registration state. So is Minnesota. There are already existing back-end automatic voter registration states that are interested in potentially being accepted from that. Um, I'm not saying that, that these are necessarily the directions it should go, but I'm saying these are discussions that are worthwhile to at least have within the organization. And then we do know there's other concerns as well about you know, making sure that there are, say, audits being conducted um, about how the data is shared. Right, things like that, or if it's ever shared, or what under what conditions, right? Right, because that's one of the concerns that that's right. exactly the, the critics have raised. And I think yeah. those are fair conversations right. to have, and we can, I think, should and can have them uh, in a civil discourse within the context of the Eric membership. Anybody else want to talk about any improvements they'd like to see or changes they'd like to see? <laughs> it's okay. Otherwise, everybody thinks it's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let, let's just uh, change uh, uh, course a little bit. Um, you know, we, we hear so much about all of the laws that have been passed recently that, that look like they're restricting voter access. But we've also seen a lot of changes over the past, you know, four or five, uh, six, seven years that actually have expanded voter access and made things a lot more efficient. Um, I think you mentioned automatic voter registration. We now have, um, I think, about half the states, um, almost half the states now use automatic voter registration. And for people who don't know, that means you know if you go to the DMV, you basically are automatically registered un if you're an eligible voter unless you opt out of the system. And that this, this has made things work more efficiently and also expanded the voter rolls. There are a lot of, a lot, most of the states now have online voter registration to make it more efficient. Um, we also have um, um, same day voter registration, which I guess about 22 states I think have that now. Um, so I'm curious how these changes have affected your ability to maintain accurate voter rolls. And, and just has it, some people will, will say, oh, it's just, that's led to some of the bloating of voter rolls. Could you, somebody address that? 
I'll, uh, I'll, I'll speak to, to that from the Georgia perspective. Uh, Georgia actually implemented automatic voter registration in September of 2016. It was one of the first states uh, to do so, I think second behind only Oregon. Um, it, was, it was not something that uh, was really talked about a lot when we were getting criticized you know, in the 2018 election cycle. Um, but then I think studies have found that Georgia has actually one of the most successful automatic voter registration programs. Um, and I think it's a couple reasons why, and, and you know, maybe you guys can, as y'all are implementing it in your states, can help. But um, Georgia was one of the first states to be fully uh, real ID compliant at the DDS, that's what we call our uh, Department of Driver Services. And, and so when you think about that, uh, Real ID, when, when people are going to uh, the DMV or DDS, as we call it in Georgia, um, that's a very secure transaction when you think about the paperwork that's being um, shown. And, and, and I mean, it, it's, so it's, it's a highly trustworthy interaction. So to use that as a basis for voter registration, um, I think is really a, a secure, like, and, and really helps with election integrity. And what we found in, in Georgia is the vast majority of, of those are people updating an address in state or just renewing their license with no change. But what's helpful about that is that's kind of a, uh, a touch point where it's kind of um, confirming, hey, I'm still here. Right, right. Um, and so I think a, that part of automatic voter registration, I think, is, is not talked about as much kind of in the activist community, but it really, I think, helps um, on, on that side of it. And, and Jeremy, I, oh, no, go ahead. Because um, um, California has automatic voter registration. I, I, my, I recall that there were some bumps initially because of the database with the, the DMV. Um, so how are you finding it working now? And the, the process has matured um, significantly. We uh, have recent legislation, SB 450, within the state of California that um, dramatically changed the voter experience within um, the state. And it discussed things like early voting, same-day registration. Um, we also have legislation that, that basically allows us to send a vote-by-mail ballot to every registered voter um, and if they would like to cast that ballot or if they want to vote in person they they actually have that option um, and you know overall the as time goes on the process matures we have a system within the state of California called VoteCal and and VoteCal has connectivity to um, uh, county election management systems and and feeds that real-time data uh, from uh, the DNV and has inputs of deceased voters, um, et cetera. And when you implement a large, uh, complex system with, with a sophisticated architecture, you're going to have some bumps early on, but over time it, it, it gets better and better. And um, the feedback not only from LA County, but many of our partner uh, counties within the state is that um, things are, are a lot more smooth. Can I just mention one example from Minnesota, a very recent example, that I think can bridge some of the ideological divides. So just last Friday, I still feel the glow. We had the <laughs> signing ceremony in Minnesota yes, right. for the Democracy for the People Act, which, thank you. A lot of people, including very supportive me, yeah, we're working here. on for a lot of years. It's a sort of democracy package. But one of the items was AVR, automatic voter registration. And in Minnesota, let me tell you how I hope that will play out to mend some of these um, uh, or, or uh, heal some of these, these ideologically based wounds. So as I mentioned before, for just about 50 years to the day from where we're standing in 1973, uh, Minnesota became one of the first states to do same day or election day registration. And a recurring criticism of that over the decades in Minnesota and elsewhere is that from the standpoint of integrity, if someone registers same day, you can't do the filtering, screening, and checking until that point, until game day, until then and there. That's when the process starts. And my response as we were trying to get automatic voter registration passed is to those skeptics, if that's the way you feel, then this AVR, this is the bill for you. Because we estimate in Minnesota that same day election registration will be uh, cut by probably 80 or 90% yeah. hmm. for real. Yeah. 
right. because people simply won't have the need to do that. That's people right. will have already been in the system That's right. for weeks and more likely months before election day, meaning you can do the filtering and the checking and the screening and the vetting months and months in advance of election day. You can have both at the same time. So I'm hoping over time we can get to the place where we see this as a win-win. Well, um, we now have time for questions. Um, so if, if anybody who has a question, we have mics, and looks like we have a couple already. Um, how about Pam? No, 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 we need the mic. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> they have two, it would be really loud. Uh, I actually thought uh, Secretary Simon was going to say that most Minnesotans moved to California, but I was wrong about that. Um, since the summer of 2016, we, uh, as an organization, work on a project we call Can you Check explain what your organization is? Oh, sorry. Okay. Verified voting. Okay. And we work on election security. And we have worked on a project to ask voters to check their registration. In fact, Pam Fessler was one of the first people to write about that project, okay. and we do that with other NGOs. And we see it as a sort of a canary in the coal mine. If something is amiss with your registration, then that helps the election official when you let them know. And they can you know, see what happened there. Um, I think we should add a component to knock election officials over with a feather by saying, also, tell them when you move, <laughs> just to see how that goes. But I wonder if that's helpful to you. Is that something that election officials also have campaigns that we could pile on to? And um, you know anything else you could say about that kind of uh, practice? How we could help spread the word? I, I will say in my state, we before every election, you know, starting right around uh, National Voter Registration Day, you know, a couple months before Election Day, we really use that opportunity as a push, not only to encourage folks to register uh, online or what have you, but also to check your registration. And I especially think, you know, one of the things that I think we haven't touched on yet is how critical any sort of online AVR or same day registration component was in 2020 during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, because first of all, we just had massively increased interest in the election because of everything that was going on in the world at that time, but nobody could leave their house. Um, so I think um, you know being able to use those focal points, but especially to have those tools and resources available to be able to let folks check and update and register is absolutely critical. Agreed, agreed. In, in fact, uh, one of the things that I do uh, when I speak to a group is I have folks pull out their phone and go to our website and check their uh, voter registration. And you know, we were we were recently testing our mail ballot app, our online mail ballot application process, which we plan to roll out in the special election. And one of our staff members found a discrepancy in his uh, in his voter registration. So it's something that we should do, and 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 I've made a point to do wherever we go and whenever we talk to voters. What, what about? Oh, did you want? To say? Yeah, yeah, Pam, we worked extensively uh, with with you, and I would say that. It's, it's very important um, for voters to understand that the first layer of accountability is, is with us as a voter, to manage our footprint, our identity. So uh, the best form of, of defense is to start with the voter, an active, engaged voter that's actively managing the accuracy of that record. So it's very, very important we do have uh, outreach campaigns uh, for that. For the most part, uh, we get a lot of engagement from voters, especially, unfortunately or not, you know, right before your election periods. But but we do find a high level of engagement in response to that outreach. When Pam was talking about that, I did one of the first stories, but when I, I actually went on the computer at the time. I can't remember what year it was to check my son, who was a recent college student, and I saw that he was still registered in the state of Maryland. He had gone to the University of Michigan. He was still registered in Michigan, and he had just recently moved to California, and he was registered in California. <laughs> 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 um, but again, you know, he just, like most Americans, didn't, you know, um, 
follow up with as election officials. Um, there was another question. Here. People yeah, are moving to California. <laughs> Hi, I am Sophie Hersher Andorsky from A More Perfect Union, the Jewish Partnership for Democracy. And I've spoken to some of you over Zoom, so it's nice to see you in all three dimensions. <laughs> uh, and there's been a lot of talk from the very beginning of the panel about the need to educate consumers and voters and all different sectors of society about the complexity of elections in addition to just sort of where to vote on what day. Um, and I'm wondering what the best way is to utilize civil society actors in that. In, in addition to helping to v register voters, what are other ways that civil society in my situation, you know, faith-based communities and clergy, but it applies to all different civil society actors. Like, how can we be helping you seed some of this information and seed some of the habits and norms and behaviors that will make your life easier? It's a great question. One thing that comes to mind for me is this idea, not surprisingly, of trusted messengers. And I only half joke to people all the time, I will do whatever is helpful to the cause up to and including shutting up. <laughs> Meaning, and especially for elected officials, it's tempting for all of us, let's face it, to think that we're the best messenger all the time, right? Because we're elected. I don't think that's necessarily the case. So I think it's up to many of us to work with people who are trusted messengers in a particular community. It could be a faith community. It could be other affinity communities. Um, but, but finding out who those are, and, and that uh, extends to various dimensions of the work we do, whether it's voter outreach or, or, or other things that we do, finding the person who people trust in a particular community who already have the relationships that we can't possibly have in the Office of Secretary of State, finding those people to be the trusted messengers. That may seem obvious, but that's sort of uh, a guiding principle for our office. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. You have been doing, you did do that in 2022. So maybe you can give us an example of, of how you did work with some of these, you know, trusted messengers. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of, of immigrant communities, uh, new Americans. There are growing and vital networks, um, sometimes in the faith community, sometimes not, sometimes in an economic realm in Minnesota, among East African and Southeast Asian communities in particular. And I think it was effective for us and others to enlist them in nonpartisan voter outreach. This goes back to 2020 as well, the COVID election, a scary time, a time of great anxiety and uncertainty. And we were able to enlist trusted voices in those communities to get across information on what the rules are and how they've changed. Um, and so we've had some real success in new American communities in Minnesota, finding those people who communities already know and already trust. And Ryan, you said? That's, I think that's a great question. Uh, we have welcomed a lot of uh, you know, third party groups who are here to help at Georgia, especially over the past couple of years. Um, and I, I think Jeremy's right, you know, first of all, there's a responsibility on the voter to kind of be aware of, okay, am I registered? Is it up to date? Where's my polling place? I think our responsibility as government officials, uh, in my, formerly in my case, was uh, is let's make sure they have the tools that, that can do that. And I think everyone's talked about the websites they have in Georgia. It's called My Voter Page. Um, and I think for you guys, be aware of those tools also, because we've had a lot of, I mean, we had a third party group who was here to help in Georgia out to register voters. And all they did was basically dump boxes of you know, disorganized and messy and sometimes fraudulent registrations on counties that were either illegible or just duplicate or, you know, in some cases even fraudulent. Whereas if you're going, if you're interacting with a voter and you're saying, hey, let's check your, if you're registered, here's how we do that. Is that up to date? Um, hey, you, you can actually update it online. Like, you know, when you, when, if you know those things, that makes the life of an election official at the county so much easier, um, reduces the delay in, in processing, it, it, it decreases any errors because everything's uh, electronic. So I think that's a great, just be aware of those tools and kind of what's, what works best for the local election official. And it's almost always going to be kind of an electronic form of communication. Yeah, I, so for LA County, um, we have thousands of micro communities within the county. So faith-based organizations for us plays a pivotal role 
in ensuring that we're providing services um, that are accessible. Uh, we provide uh, language assistance for over 18 languages within LA County. Um, that's just one example. Um, and, um, you know, we work with various advocacy groups, faith-based organizations, et cetera, to ensure that our vote centers are placed in a location that's relevant to specific communities. Um, so please continue to engage um, at, at whatever level and um, definitely um, continue to be um, vocal to ensure that you know, the individuals to your you know, congregation, to your communities are, have a voice at that table. Because when you manage these large bureaucracies, um, it, it's very, very easy to have things lost in translation. So, so you wanna make sure that you have the appropriate community partners at the table. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Yes. Um, Lisa Danitz, I'm a voting and elections policy consultant. Um, so thank you all for being here. I think uh, this question is directed to all of you, but I'm particularly interested in hearing from you, Ryan. Okay. Um, so I think given the current context, it is, um, it is not surprising how much emphasis there is on making sure uh, people are taken off of the rolls if they've moved, you know, deceased, incarcerated. But there are risks, right, on both sides. And there are infrequent voters who could get a notice and they don't check their mail or whatever it is. I'm curious, especially in light of your comments about potentially revising the NVRA, what are the kind of protections that you think are a good idea so that people who are properly registered but are not particularly active voters, maybe per not particularly active mail readers, I don't know, um, so that they are not removed from the list. So in a state like Minnesota, right, where you have election day registration, you have that built in as a fail safe. And so I'm just kind of curious, I'd love to hear from all of you, the protections you recommend for those infrequent voters, but, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, no. but you <laughs> talk about we'll start with Ryan and right. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll think go quick, because I think uh, everyone's probably thought about that. Um, some, one, from a policy perspective, I do think we need to think about how are we communicating with voters, because mail is probably not the best way. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in Georgia, I think we're trying to collect more and more email addresses of voters, um, but even then you have to be careful. Uh, but I think, so that's, that's one thing to think about from, from how do you communicate and, and let people communicate quickly. Um, two, it's happened in, in the past uh, where, you know, we've gotten um, good data, but good data is not perfect data, and we've removed someone who, you know, was not dead yet, right? And so, <laughs> we, uh, and they've reached out and essentially proven, it, hey, I'm not dead yet. Um, and and um, in, in that case, one, you can, if you, if obviously, if you learn that prior to an election, then you can resolve it then. If you learn it at an election, they cast a provisional ballot and can, and can solve it then. So that provisional ballot role, um, and we have the same thing with um, uh, felony convictions in Georgia, where they can say, hey, I'm, this system is saying I have a felony conviction. Um, I don't. Let me cast a provisional ballot and, and, and resolve that. Um, so that, that's one way to handle it. You, know, you, you obviously want to be careful because you don't want to increase provisional ballots because that puts a lot on election officials too. But um, I, think, I think those three things. Like, so basically, how do we communicate with voters quickly and let them communicate with government officials easily? And then two, um, that provisional ballot rule. Automatic voter registration, online voter registration, same day voter registration. Um, we do all three of those in my state, and I will um, see Ryan and raise him that in New Mexico, we just passed a democracy package um, that says that if you are out of jail, you can vote. And I know that some of my colleagues actually um, even have voting in their states for folks who are incarcerated for felonies. We haven't gone quite that far in my state yet. But basically, to your point, if, if you're saying, hey, I'm here, <laughs> I'm not currently in, in prison, just like I'm not currently dead, um, then you can cast a ballot. And so we think that that is going to um, improve the situation there as well. 
and and to your point, you know, we made a we made an effort to let people know that we pulled those sixty thousand plus people off the the rolls. At the same time, we are vigorously promoting same day voter registration. Uh, it's it's a priority of our administration, and and we do have um, the provisional ballot option for folks as well. And I would just say in Minnesota, I cringe at the term purge. Yes. It's not really accurate. In Minnesota, people are put on inactive status, and it's relatively easy to get off of inactive status. Uh, there are obviously exceptions to that, like dead people. Of course, then it's not easy. Uh, yes, right. And they, they really are. It's very hard, right, as it should be. But, well, but, but it is easy those... if they show up, though. I mean, you can do, cause they, right. even, even they are not purged. They, you can see up, oh, you, you were removed, yep. and but you actually shouldn't have been. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, similar to Minnesota, we, we place voters on, on an inactive status. Um, and, and I agree with you. I, you know, right, right now at home on my dining room table is a stack of mail. And I won't get to that mail until hopefully Sunday when, when the week, you know, slows down and everything like that. So you have to have diverse ways and modalities of engaging voters to educate them on um, you know, their status as, you know, active and inactive um, voters. And, and, and we find that very, very critical. In LA County and, and the state of California, uh, we push accessibility. You know, these, you know, ways are here in front of you. It is accessible to you. Um, if you are allowed by law to vote, we want it to be easy and accessible for you. So. Um, the philosophy for us is, is pretty simple. Do, I'm just curious, do any of you see, and, and we only have a couple of minutes left, you know, going forward, um, what, what kind of improvements would you like to see overall on this whole idea of maintaining accurate lists? I mean, is there something that you would like to see happen that hasn't happened yet? We're a little bit stuck in the 90s with the NVRA, yeah. and so I know that's a kind of pie in the sky, but if, if there well, is, could you explain to people what the NVRA? Yeah, so Nas National Voter Registration Act, which um, you know, that's what uh, puts in place a list maintenance requirement. Also puts in place the, you know, two general election cycles. Um, we've made a lot of progress in Georgia with trying to kind of really work on how mailings look to try to increase that engagement. Because if a voter says, "Hey, I in fact have moved," you can go ahead and, and remove them immediately, and that I think enfranchises a voter because it tells them oh, I need to make sure I'm registered in my new state. Um, and so I, I think if, if there's a, from a policy perspective, thinking, okay, in the 21st century, um, decent ways in the 21st century at this point, how should we, how should we do this? Anybody else? Well, I would say something that's not really a legal change, but I would just say continuing discussions of this kind to try to explain, all of us as a community, um, that keeping track of people like this, in a, as, as Secretary Morey said, in an increasingly mobile society is, is difficult but doable. And that when you hear about someone being registered in more than one state, don't jump to a bad, false conclusion. It's human nature, as we've all been saying, for people not to uh, tell their voting office when they leave that they're leaving. And so there are reasons for some of these anomalies, but they are anomalies, and they're correctable and they're fixable. Yeah, I, I, I think also managing mis- and disinformation, yes. which, is, which is probably the biggest threat to democracy, in my opinion. Um, because, you know, what we've tried so hard to do is educate our electorate and educate voters. Um, but ultimately, uh, mis- and disinformation uneducates them. Right. right? It takes all of the time and effort that many of your organizations and your staffs, et cetera, have put into that process, and it undoes that, and um, basically puts us three steps uh, back. So finding more sophisticated contemporary ways to manage mis- and disinformation without sounding defensive, but right. yet, you know, just factual. You know, you may have heard this, but this is actually uh, what you should be looking for. Um, right. Yeah, and I, I think it all comes back to this idea of educating voters and the, yes. and the public about a topic that most of them really did not care about at all <laughs> right. a few years ago, um, but now I think is 
quite important. Um, so anyway, I want to thank you all very much and uh, thank the audience as well. And